Hello, and welcome to another Voices of Worship Hymnology Unveiled study. This week, we will be studying the well-loved Christian hymn, At Calvary, which resonates deeply with many believers, offering a powerful reflection on repentance and the transformative grace found at Calvary where Jesus was crucified. This hymn's history and composition carry significant insights into its enduring impact on Christian worship. So let's take a look at the history, followed by an in-depth look at the lyrics to each verse and the chorus, tying them with scripture. The lyrics to, let me adjust my mic here, the lyrics to At Calvary, were penned by William Reed Newell, who was born in Savannah, Ohio in 1868, which incidentally makes him about 100 years older than I am, which I think was kind of cool. His educational journey took him through Wooster College in Ohio, where he graduated in 1891. And then he furthered his his studies at at Princeton and Oberlin seminaries. His pastoral career began at Bethesda Congregational Church in Chicago, but his trajectory changed in 1895 when D.L. Moody invited him to serve as the assistant superintendent of the Moody Bible Institute under R.A. Torrey. <clears throat> Newell's contributions extended far beyond administrative roles to significant biblical exposition. He was renowned for his Bible classes that attracted large audiences in cities like Chicago, St. Louis, and Toronto. His ability to explain Bible texts texts <laughs> led led to the publication of widely respected commentaries, notably on Romans, Hebrews, and Revelation. These works are still celebrated for their clear grasp of God's grace in Christ and their insightful exploration of scriptural truths. One of Newell's most enduring legacies is the hymn at Calvary, inspired spontaneously as he prepared for a class at the Moody Bible Institute, from what I read, he was actually on his way to class and he slipped off into another room to write down the words to this song on, on an envelope, I think it was. So I think that's pretty cool. You never know when, when, when that inspiration is going to strike, when, when the Holy Spirit's going to move on you to, to write those words down. And you have to be ready whenever he does. But the hymn reflects his, his deep understanding of mercy and grace and redemption, themes that, that permeate his sermons and his writings. His influence extends beyond his lifetime. With his commentaries and, and hymnody, hymnody continuing to inspire and educate both lay people and theological scholars, Newell's life and work will are underscored by his profound grasp of biblical doctrine and his ability to communicate complex theological concepts in an accessible manner. In other words, he made it plain for us to understand. Now, the music for At Calvary was composed by Daniel Brink Towner, who was an influential American composer known for his contribution to Christian hymnody with a legacy that includes over 2,000 hymns. He was born in Rome, Pennsylvania in 1850. Towner's musical journey was deeply influ influenced by his early training under his father, leading to further studies with Notable teachers such as John Howard and George Root. 
his significant contributions to Christian music began to take shape through various roles as music director in churches across New York, Ohio, and Kentucky, before ultimately serving at the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago from 1893 until his death in 1919. Towner's collaboration with D.L. Moody marked a pivotal period in his career, expanding his influence within the Christian evangel- evangelistic, I'm having trouble with these words today, his Christian evangelistic community, and cementing his role at the Moody Bible Institute and his development in, in hymnody. But his, his tenure at, at the Bible, Moody Bible Institute was characterized by a dedication to teaching and a passion for integrating music into Christian worship and evangelism, impacting countless individuals through both his compositions and his role as an educator. His body of work includes hymns such as Trust and Obey and At Calvary, which remain popular in Christian worship today, showcasing his ability to capture theological truths and the essence of the Christian faith through music. Towner was also recognized for his musical achievements with a doctorate of music from the American Temperance Society, a university in 1900, which is a testament to his skill, his influence, and his contribution to church music. Towner's legacy is preserved not only through his hymns, but also through the memories and stories shared by those who knew him, reflecting a life devoted to music and faith, his contributions extend beyond the notes on a page. They offer a glimpse into the heart of a man who used his talents to serve and glorify God, leaving an, an, an indelible mark on Christian hymnody and the lives of all who, who listen to his music. At Calvary was first published in 1895, making its debut during a time of revival and renewal in the Christian church across the United States and abroad. Its message of redemption through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross quickly resonated with believers, making it a staple in hymnals and and church services. In the context of things going on in the, in the States and around the world, the publication of Calvary was more than just the release of a new hymn. It was a reflection of an America in transition. The hymn with its themes of redemption and personal transformation resonated deeply in a society experiencing rapid change and and seeking moral and spiritual grounding. The convergence of technological progress, social reform, and evolving national identity created a fertile ground for the hymn's message to spread across the nation, embedding it firmly within the fabric of American religious and cultural life. And it still is resonating today. Now let's look at verse 1 of At Calvary. It says, Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. This verse talks about the sinner's careless, prideful state before recognizing the need for Christ. Now, I was raised in church. I was the preacher's kid. But I ran from God for many years. 
I believed in God, but circumstances and, and challenges had me questioning everything and, and running from the direction I felt God pulling me toward. I didn't want anything to do with ministry. And I knew he was calling me to that. And I couldn't understand some of the things that, that were going on in my life. But I did believe in him, but I wasn't serving him. I was running from him. I didn't want to follow him. I, I didn't think I was worthy of his love or his grace. But then one evening when I was in college, I heard him calling to me again, telling me it was time to stop running. God became real to me that day. Jesus' sacrifice for me became real. You see, I was like the prodigal son. Okay, I'm a daughter, but it's like the prodigal son. And if you know the story of the prodigal son, he, he didn't want anything to do with his father's household. He wanted his money, nothing else. So he, he got his inheritance early and left. But then he spent it all. He partied. He spent it all. He did all the things he wanted to do. But then in Luke 15, 17 through 20 in the New Living Translation, he realizes what he's done. And it says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, father, I have sinned against you, both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with com love and compassion, he ran to his son embraced him and kissed him. You see, when we realize our need for him, when we realize our vanity and our pride, and we realize what Jesus did for us, and we realize that, that what he did on Calvary was for us, we can know that, that he did that for us. And, and while we're still a long way off, God is running to us. You see, God pursues us. I thank God that he did not stop pursuing me, even though I was running from him. He's not going to stop pursuing you either. In Romans 5, 8, in the New Living Translation, it says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Christ did this for us. God did this for us. While we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, he died for us. So let me ask you, where were you? Or where are you? mentally, emotionally, spiritually, before you realized your need for your Savior, Jesus Christ. Think about that. Ponder on that. You're welcome to write your response in the comments. Just think about what Christ did for you. Search your heart. Search your life. Come to him. Verse 2 about Calvary goes on to say, By God's word, at last my sin I learned. 
Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. This verse reflects on the realization of God's mercy and the grace that was extended at Calvary. You see, we have to acknowledge our sins before we can ask for forgiveness. We have to admit that we were wrong. We have to admit that it's the heart of God that we've been breaking. But God, but God, Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 in the New Living Translation says, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. But God. You see, once we acknowledge our sin, once we acknowledge our our fault, our wrong, once we acknowledge that that the things that we've been doing, that the life that we've been living has been contrary to what God has called us to, contrary to the life that that he wants for us, contrary to his law. And I'm not talking about the Levitical law. I'm talking about his law to have no other God before him, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, with all your might, and to love others as you love yourself. But you have to love yourself first because you have to love yourself like God loved you, loves you. He gave his son for you. He gave his son for me. But we have to admit and acknowledge our failures and ask him for forgiveness because he is so rich in mercy that he was, he is so ready right there to forgive us. John three sixteen, I'm sure you know this. You can probably quote it, but I'll read it out of the New Living Translation. It says, "For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him." will not perish, but have eternal life. Now, my husband often, when he reads this scripture, when he talks about it, especially in his sermons, he says, put your name there in the place of world. So, for God, for this is how God loved Phyllis. This is how God loved, put your name there. This is how God loved Susie. This is how God loved Jeff. I don't know who's listening, but whoever you are, put your name there. He gave his one and only son so that you, if you believe in him, you will not perish, but have eternal life. This is personal. He did this for you personally. He did this for me personally. He is a personal God. (coughs) If you've accepted him, especially, you, you, you can answer this question. But if you haven't accepted him, I'd like you to ponder it as well. How have moments of confronting your own sins and understanding the depth of God's mercy and grace transformed your relationship with him and your perspective on forgiveness? Think about that question. I know when I admitted my sin and I admitted my need for him and I stopped running from him and I realized his mercy and his grace, it most definitely transformed my relationship. I've become closer and closer to him as the years have passed, as, as things have, have drawn me in 
to a closer relationship with him as I've relied on him more. To know that he forgave me for the things that I did and the things that I, mistakes I continue to make because I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. But search your heart. Search your life. What has he done for you? How has, has his mercy and grace transformed you? Do you know that he, he, he extends forgiveness to you? Pray you do.